healthy community. So it's about how housing relates to having a healthy community environment. Um, it's a local to global because we have folks here from the Fuller, Fuller Center for Housing. How many of you have heard of the Fuller Center? Okay, great. So I know you may have heard of Habitat for Humanity. Um, and this is very similar and they, they are connections and I'm gonna let uh, David explain that. But we have our, the staff here from both the Fuller Center International and the America Sumter Fuller Center. Uh, David Snell is the executive director and he's been with, the, with Fuller Center since 2005. When, and Millard Fuller, who actually started Habitat, and he's gonna tell you more, uh, was the executive director until 2009 when he died, and David took over the, the position. Ryan Iafolia. Ifiola. Ifiola. It's a good Italian name, Ifiola. Works with the international housing uh, projects that they are involved with, and you'll get to see a lot of interesting aspects of the work that they're doing. And that here is the construction director for the American Center Fuller Center uh, Housing Office. And uh, we're also fortunate to have him here because he's from America and so lives here to share more about his experience from the local perspective. There will be a uh, Swiping at the end of the program to get Windows to the World credit on either side of the exit. And we also have a lot of information tables set up behind. So you're welcome to, after this program, we'll have information about the Fuller Center, but we also have uh, representatives from the European Council who are promoting programs within the University System of Georgia for summer study abroad and our Bulgaria program. So feel free to stop by the table uh, after this, and they'll also be open by the cafeteria today. So it's a great opportunity to find out and ask questions if you have more specific uh, interest in any of these programs. Okay, so with that, uh, and I want to thank Jeff Green, director of the theater, for letting us use the space. Thank you. And y'all need to come see the show this weekend that's happening here, so that's a great, I want to plug that. Um, but with this, we'll start with uh, David. And you've got this. You're using both. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It, uh, we don't get to play to a full house very often, so this is, this is kind of exciting. And I know that you're all here voluntarily, uh, so we will try to make this as interesting and as painless as we can. Now, I saw when she asked how many of you knew about the Fuller Center that uh, <laughs> I don't, didn't see a single arm go up. So I have a big assignment. In five minutes, I've got to tell you everything you need to know about the Fuller Center for Housing. So pay attention. We're going to go back to 1942. Do we have time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, actually, it is. In 1942, an interesting thing happened here in Sumter County. A man named Clarence Jordan and his wife Florence and another couple called the Englands bought a farm outside of Americas and uh, set it up as a Koinonia farm with the goal of making it a demonstration plot of the kingdom of heaven. Now, we'll flash forward to the late 60s, and there, a young couple came to visit the farm. Now, this young couple uh, is Montgomery, and, and the husband in the household had made a goal of making a million dollars by the time he was 30 years old. That was the only thing that mattered to him, and by golly, he did it. And uh, um, in the process, he lost his family. His wife left him. So they got back together and started talking about it, and they decided, you know, all this money hasn't bought us much. It's bought us a nice house and nice cars and horses and boats, but it hasn't bought us happiness. So let's get rid of it. So they did. They started getting rid of all of their assets and giving the, the money to the poor. And they said, we'll just wait and see what God has in mind. Well, they ended up visiting Koinonia Farm, and Millard Fuller is the man that I'm talking about, and he and his wife stopped by for a visit and ended up before they were done living there for several years. And Millard and Clarence clicked. They were buddies. They understood one another. Now Clarence was a theologian. He was a philosopher. Millard was an entrepreneur, a let's get the job done thing. And they were trying to figure out what they could do at the farm that would reach out to the community. 
They came up with the notion of partnership housing. Now, if everything you hear today, the next sentence is the most important thing I want you to take home and remember. Clarence wrote, before he died, he wrote this. He said, what the poor need isn't charity, it's capital. Not social workers, but co-workers. And what the rich need is a wise, just, and honorable way of divesting themselves of their overabundance. So you put those things together and you find ways to actually make a significant difference in the lives of the poor. So they started building some houses, but they built it using that philosophy. And so rather than being a charity and giving these houses away, the families helped build the houses. And then they paid for them. Now the Bible says don't charge interest to the poor. So their program was not to charge interest to the poor, and what resulted was a very affordable way for very poor people to have a decent place to live. And that was the essence of the uh, philosophy that ultimately became Habitat for Humanity, 1976. And then in uh, 2005, Millard and Linda were separated from Habitat. Millard was a young 70 at the time, could not find the word retirement anywhere in the Bible, and he wanted to keep doing what he'd always done, so we started the Fuller Center for Housing. Fuller Center is very similar to Habitat. We build houses and renovate houses, and restore houses all across the country and around the world with families in need. But we use this charitable notion, of the families actually being edified by the process. You know, charity has a tendency, when it's overdone, to make people captives of it. This is what you see in a place like Haiti where people can no longer do things for themselves because everything has been given to them for so long. This enlightened charity where the families actually participate, they're edified by it, they're built up by it, their honor is restored. I have to watch my watch because I've got a, a time limit here that I'm sneaking up on. Now, the Fuller Center uh, operates now, we have operations in 70 US cities and in 20 other countries, and we'll show you some of what we're doing here in a few minutes. But everything that we do follows this notion. All of these organizations across the country and around the world are grassroots organizations like America Sumter where they operate locally, they select the families locally, they build the houses locally, they raise the money locally, and then they collect the, the uh, mortgage payments uh, which are affordable for the families and use them to build more houses. It's really a very elegant system. The Fuller Center is an ecumenical Christian organization. What that means is we are unashamedly Christian and enthusiastically ecumenical. We invite everyone to the table. There's no religious test. I built a house last year in Shreveport uh, with a Muslim family. So we work with anyone that comes forward that has the need, that has the willingness to participate, and has the ability, although it might be meager, to pay back that loan over time on terms that they can afford. So that's what the Fuller Center does. Uh, we uh, were born at Cornelia Farm, and uh, I hope you all get a chance to visit down there sometime because it's a fascinating place. Uh, Sumter County, Georgia. How many of you are from Sumter County? Boy, look at that. Very few. Uh, this is a vortex of energy here in Sumter County, Georgia. I don't know how it happened, but a lot of interesting things come out of Sumter County. You know, they said that no good could come out of Bethlehem. It was too small. Well, that's what they say about Sumter County. And by golly, all kinds of good stuff comes out of Sumter County, Georgia. So I'm glad that you're all here. Uh, we're going to uh, spend a little bit more time talking about why we do what we do. And then we're going to show you some of the work that we do around the world. So Ryan, okay. uh, what's that name? It's Ayafiola. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. So uh, I want to move on to a section we're going to call Why Housing. <coughs> so you might recognizing the need. There's all kinds of worlds, uh, need in the world. There's educational need, there's health need, there's hunger needs, there's violence. Um, so why do we choose to focus on housing? I'll give you one simple reason. And the simple reason is that housing is too often perceived as an effect of poverty. Inadequate housing, they say, well, that person doesn't have a good house just because they're poor. But what they miss is that having an inadequate house causes a person and a family to go through all kinds of difficulties and struggles that traps them into poverty. So when we can help a family have a decent place to live, it changes so many different aspects of their life. It changes education. Can you imagine if you came to, to GSW and they said, okay, great, welcome, you're gonna be uh, studying and having a lot of work over the next few years. Now we've arranged some dorms for you. There are basically some tin sheds outside, not really any bathrooms or showers. I don't expect to live there for four years and study. 
and do your work. It would be impossible. You'd be so distracted just trying to survive, just trying to get by. You'd be getting sick. Your grades would suffer. Most of you would probably drop out. I would drop out in that case. So having a decent place to live totally transforms the family from being in survival mode to being in a place where they can raise their gaze and begin to thrive, focus on education, worry about more than just, just today's need. So we have noticed that studies have proven it, that education improves when you have a decent place to live. Um, health improves. The studies have shown that people in a, just having one study was done in Mexico, just where they help families have um, uh, a better floor and a better roof. And just even with those simple changes, getting families off of living in dirt floors, getting roofs that don't leak, they, their kids got sick 44% less often. Simple change like that. Doesn't, we take those things for granted, it doesn't seem like much to us. Totally changes the health uh, trajectory of those families' lives. Incomes. We did a study in Armenia, one of our biggest projects in the nation of Armenia. And entrepreneurship rates tripled. And why might that happen? Entrepreneurship. I mean, starting your own business, finding ways to create income for yourself. Well, for us, we think one of the reasons that happens is because of our process, because we're doing it in a way, as David said, is building up families. They're working on it together. They've seen that they can accomplish things. And another thing is that it gives them a very stable uh, castle, if you will, from which to launch their lives. So they can sell things from their front porch, as you've seen in many parts of the world. Uh, families now have a place that can act not only as a place to sleep at night, but also a place in which to run their dreams, their businesses that they might have in mind. In improved dignity and self-worth, we hear that a lot from families. Um, when they moved from a place that they were ashamed of, that they felt like they weren't an acceptable part of the community to a decent home, now they have dignity and self-worth. They can keep their heads high when they walk around, and that's a huge thing for so many people. And the fifth uh, way that housing acts as not just a uh, effect of poverty, but also a cause, is it is very difficult on a family and a community when you have poverty housing. You drive down the street and you see shacks on the road. Well, no one wants to deal with that because that's someone else's problem. But it brings down the whole neighborhood. It also is hard on the families who have to live in that situation. All kinds of trouble, especially if you're being bounced around place to place. Maybe you don't own a place. You're just renting. You're just squatting, going wherever you can. When you have a decent home that you own, and home ownership is crucial to our vision, um, you're stable, and it uplifts communities, it uplifts your family, and you have that basic building block intact. Now, there's many things that can go wrong in a family, a house isn't everything, but if you don't have a house, you are definitely in trouble. So we want to do what we can to help change that. So we want to just let um, someone from this area share. Dad's one of my heroes. He is not only a Fuller Center volunteer and um, a leader with the local work. He's also a Fuller Center homeowner. So we asked him to share uh, briefly some of his story. I hope you'll get as much out of it. Hello, everyone. Hello, oh, welcome to the Can. Make sure I love you. Being here for a long time. I'm one of the locals from around him. And to back up what they're saying, I'm one of the people that they here. Well, uh, it was my day I was in a uh, something happened in the back. I didn't know it was in the gym, they could scratch. And uh, one day, I was in a car accident, and I broke my back. And back of my back, I broke, it seemed like, you know, that was it, life was over. Sometimes things happen uh, because of some new days, or sometimes, sometimes life just, it don't go the way that you thought it was going to go. And that's kind of one of the things that happened to me. And so I got in a place where I needed some help from the food center. I would never thought that I would need them or have that, nobody like that. But I did. And most of all, and after the accident, you know, my, my life just, it was just day after day I had to go back home to my mom. After uh, the accident, because I couldn't find work. I mean, I couldn't work, so I left good well. And my day I heard about the food center, and they were really high with it. Because I've been in the accident going to hold me, yes, and they built one for me. And that's how I, I got to, to know these people. And uh, I was at, like they said, not a hand, not a hand up. So I had to also, they asked me to, to do sweating for this. I didn't know what that was. That means that you work along with the people. They build in their house. I said, these people must 
fancy down in the wheelchair. And I can't be doing that. What's wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> but it goes to behold. Uh, some, and, and as I was working along with the people, some inside me woke up. And uh, I went as healthy as I thought I would. And my strength started coming back. And I looked and I started helping. And people like y'all come. And they, I worked along with some people like y'all. And I'm still working along with people like y'all ever since. And y'all know what a blessing and y'all know be to the people that y'all even met yet. But most of all, I want to say thank you. You yeah, asked me to share my story, but I'm so nervous. And I'm so grateful to be here. And the thing that they're saying is true. And y'all do, and you don't change so many people's lives just by coming, just by participating. And then it's, it, most of all, you think you change. I mean, you change my life, but it's going to also do the same for you. And you don't give you a sense of, of sin. You, I, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, this ain't what I do. <laughs> but I just want to say, thank you. I just want to say thank y'all for, for time. And I know that y'all going to enjoy You're going to get a lot of ideas if, if one would sign up. And a little more like a photo Thank you. I'm overjoyed. I really don't know what, like, what to say or how to say it, but I just know that the thing that they're saying is, is, is great in the work that I've done here. And can you imagine me? being one of the people that needed a home of okay uh, now before y'all asked them, yeah, come to help them because they help me with most like don't have to do too. And you get to meet people like that. And I hope you involved here locally is you'll get to know that you get to work with them so we hope some of you will choose choose to do that um, quick question to keep pulling the audience here how many people here have ever traveled outside of the United States okay good portion of you well I somehow I think I'll do a lot of traveling I thought you've been to all the places we're going to show next we're going to go for a quick world tour to highlight some of the local work that the Polar Center for Housing is doing so we're going to do it very fast, so hang on tight. OK, so our, first we'll just highlight, we're not going to go through every country that we work in, but we just want to show that we are all over the map. Uh, we like to say, to use the old British <laughs> phrase, that uh, the sun never sets on the Fuller Center for Housing, uh, because somewhere around the world, there's always work going on. So we're going to start our tour with the country of Bolivia. Bolivia is one of our newest projects, but we have now started a 60 home project there that's going to be uh, completed over the next uh, six to nine months. So it's a very um, exciting, fast paced project for us. And I had mentioned health earlier. This is a, a perfect example of that. There is a bug, an insect in Bolivia um, that carries the chaga disease. They call the bug the kissing bug. It has a longer name, but everyone calls it the kissing bug. And the reason they call it that because of its natural habitat is in mud and in thatch, which they use for the roofs. You can see in the house here, this is very typical in the very rural parts of Bolivia. And the bug comes out, especially at night, and it bites people on the face. Um, and that's where it gets the name, the kissing bug, but it's not a sweet kiss. It carries a disease that affects your heart um, that um, will eventually shorten the lifespan of people down there. It's not a fact that fast acting, but it's over the course of your lifetime. So what we're doing is helping families have what we call simple, decent homes. It's nothing that uh, is fancy, but it is something that totally will change the lives of families of having a dry roof, a metal roof, using bricks for walls, having a concrete floor, good windows and doors. It's gonna get rid of this bug problem for them. And it's one of the main ways that the Centers for Disease Control recommends dealing with this disease. We can move on. Next slide. Nepal. 
Um, what major event happened in Nepal about, oh, about a year and a half ago? If you know it, just yell it out. Anyone? Earthquake. Earthquake. Big earthquake. Um, destroyed hundreds of thousands of homes around the country, killed about 10,000 people. We had built uh, 24 homes in Nepal prior to the earthquake, and 12 of those were right in the earthquake zone, where 80 to 90 percent of the homes were destroyed. Every one of our homes withstood the earthquake. We couldn't even find a crack in them. Because we were using better building technology and uh, using tight controls and how we were doing our construction, so we kind of feel our calling there is not only to build homes, but also to teach people how to build better. And that's what we've been doing. Um, we've been building since the earthquake as well, about another 25 since that time, as well as training masons and teaching uh, better construction methods. I used to have Ryan's job, so I got to <coughs> do some of this work early on, and, and so I get to talk about some of these places as well. We're going to go to Peru. Uh, we're build any of you been to Peru? It's a very interesting country. It, uh, it's arid. Uh, the rain never falls in Peru. And uh, where we're building is a place called La Florida, which is uh, south of Lima, and in the very early, the foothills of the Andes. Uh, it's, a, it's desolate. It, a, a, the first time I was there, it looked like the backside of the moon, just miles and miles of brown dirt. But then there's La Florida, and those of you who know Spanish mean the, the flowering place, and I kept looking for the flowers. Well, they're there now. Uh, we've built, uh, it says 66 houses in La Florida. We are uh, actually rebuilding this entire little community. And in the process, we've done some great things. Uh, a, a group came forward with trees, and we planted 1,500 trees in La Florida. And the thing about that soil is, if you get some water to it, uh, things do blossom, and so we've got trees there. Another group is coming in to help with water, so we can get folks better water. That's a problem around the world, is having adequate uh, drinking water, uh, good drinking water, and, and so we've got a group there that's doing that. So La Florida is does, it's, it's, it's a little model of what this can be, it's this entire village uh, becomes transformed. One of the very first homeowners there, named, owned by the name of Ana, came, she'd lost everything. She lived in Lima, she was, did no, she was despaired. She did not know what to do. She came up to La Florida, ended up getting involved in the program, got a house, and she is now the mayor of La Florida. Her entire life changed like that's as a result of uh, the blessing of having a decent house. Uh, let's go on to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua is a fascinating country in Central America. It's interestingly, it's the safest place in Central America right now. Uh, we, uh, I call Nicaragua our uh, little uh, lesson in um, uh, the, the uh, notion of abundance. For years and years, we had the folks from Nicaragua calling us saying, we'd like to start a project. And we were saying, well, we need to be able to adequately fund the projects we have before we start a new one. And we were thinking in a scarcity way. We don't have enough money to do it. Well, finally, they were just relentless, and we said, all right, we'll do something in Nicaragua. And son of a gun, as soon as we did, the abundance started to flow. So it taught us a very good lesson. You have to think abundantly. Uh, and there are a lot of houses down in Nicaragua. There's 85, and they're mostly in a place um, that is a, a, a fishing village uh, right on the coast. Uh, and I'll tell you, if you're interested in taking a visit, we have these global builders tours, we call them, where folks go down different places in the world and help build a house. Uh, Nicaragua is, is really uh, a fascinating place because it's on the beach. The place they stay is right on the beach. And, uh, and the people are lovely. Interestingly, it's an indigenous uh, 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 group and the land is owned tribally. It's, it's uh, like a reservation almost. Uh, another place we're gonna visit is Nigeria. Nigeria is a, a, a huge country. It's, I think, has the largest population in Africa. It's divided in half, literally in half. The northern half is Muslim, the southern half is Christian, and uh, there's constant tension in the country. The capital of the country is Abuja. Abuja was built to be the capital of the country, sort of like Brasilia was in Brazil. So it's only about 30 years old. But it's surrounded, it's a, it's a very expensive place to live, and it's surrounded by uh, ring cities where the folks that actually work in Abuja live because they can't afford to live in, in, in town. Uh, we've got a very interesting project there where we're building actually row houses. It's called the Fuller Center Estates, uh, which is part of their British heritage. It's not really an estate, but it's a housing project. 
And uh, the families there, uh, they're quite small, and, and the families have the opportunity, uh, at once they pay for their house, to uh, apply for a larger house. And it's, it's a, a stair-stepped program. Uh, and that program continues to grow. Uh, the folks in Nigeria, they're, they're just wonderful folks, but it's a, it's a very difficult place to visit. We don't send very many teams there, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful spot. Okay. Moving on to um, El Salvador. El Salvador is another country where we have some very exciting work going on right now. Uh, we became aware about a year ago of a group of families who were living on land that uh, they've been on for about 10 years, most of them, but they've never been able to get proper title to it, as we often see around the world. And they were living on the side of this hill, muddy hill, uh, where families would walk typically uh, 30 to 40 minutes to get their clean drinking water and then have to carry it up the hill. And you see um, elderly folks, especially elderly women, having to carry this water up the hill. You have um, lots of puddles from, uh, for breeding mosquitoes, it seems. Um, people may have heard recently Zika virus, but there's also been lots of other uh, diseases that come from, uh, from mosquitoes, such as dengue, uh, uh, chicken gunia, many others. So mosquitoes are the most deadly, actually, creature in the world. And they are just swarmed with mosquitoes because of the mud on the hills. And worst of all, they're facing eviction. Because now a uh, for-profit developer wants to come in and build right there, so they all have nowhere to go. So we've been building a 90-home uh, community for each of these, these families. They're going to have, for the first time in their life, clean drinking water, a flush toilet, um, waterproof you know, uh, roof, good walls, and, uh, and they're going to have a community, a sense of uh, belonging. And it's just uh, really been an exciting project to watch. So that's been going on all year. Here's a picture of some of the construction. We can move now to Haiti, elsewhere in, in the Caribbean. Haiti is another country that had a very bad earthquake. That was uh, back in 2010. We were not working in Haiti prior to the earthquake. We got started after that. Um, but we've since built, um, coming up close to 200 houses now. And uh, all of them did very well in uh, the wake of Hurricane Matthew coming through um, last month. But uh, now there's a huge need once again. So we're, we're continuing to build in areas where we already have relationships as well as trying to do some Hurricane uh, Matthew disaster recovery. And one more. Uh, the last place we're going to visit is Armenia. How many of you have been to Armenia? I didn't figure we'd get a big response. You know where Armenia is. Uh, <coughs> Armenia is, uh, is it's, it's, it's in a very challenging neighborhood. It's a former Soviet republic. And uh, uh, north of it is Georgia. And to the uh, east of it is Azerbaijan. To the south is Turkey. <coughs> and they don't like <clears throat> the Turks and the Armenians have been at war forever, and the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians have been at war forever. Oh, and then Iran uh, touches it. So they're in a very difficult neighborhood. They're friends with the Georgians. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating country. It was the first country in the world to adopt Christianity as a state religion. And until the Turks uh, took it away from them, Mount Ararat, where the Ark was uh, uh, biblically settled, was in Armenia. Armenia is all over the Bible. It's an ancient, ancient country. We started working there in 2008, and these folks know how to get the job done. <clears throat> We've built over 500 houses in Armenia since 2008, and they are uh, more uh, European-style houses than Nicaraguan-style houses. Uh, they, there's a huge Armenian-American community. If, if someone's name ends in I-A-N, chances are good that they're of Armenian heritage. So some of the most notorious Armenians are the Kar uh, Kardashians and the Kevorkians. But there are a huge population of, of Armenians, and they're uh, very successful people. So they have been sending a lot of money back to Armenia to help them get these houses built. Uh, well, I was there this summer. We had our uh, Millard Fuller Legacy Build. It's an annual building event. We had that in Armenia this summer, and a number of us got to go over and spend a, a, a week there. But uh, it is fascinating, and I'll tell you, we do have work teams going to Armenia. If you want a fascinating experience, you might want to sign up for a, a, a work team to Armenia. One last stop on our world tour, a place you're all familiar with, America's Georgia. Anyone want to share just a couple minutes about the work we have going on here real quick? 
Uh, here in America, we got uh, a lot of different houses we got going on, and we get me by the kids together and finish the mic. But it's about, I'm gonna get back again. But most of about, just want to encourage and ask that you would come out and help. Because here in America, I live in New York, have a nice time like nobody learning, and on the weekend, you can come out. We can set up the time for we can um, we can do some uh, some videos. Thank you. Thank you. They they just dedicated uh, a new home this past weekend that was recently completed. That's exciting. Okay, so now we're going to transition a little bit. We've given you a lot of information. Maybe in the last few minutes here, we can provide a little inspiration. <laughs> uh, so why do we do it? I mean, why do we choose to be uh, a part of this uh, this work? Uh, maybe it seems exciting and glamorous to travel all these places, but it's actually a lot of really hard work. And if you go on one of our teams, we will put you to work. You're going to be working to build homes. Um, it's not it's not easy. Hopefully, it will be fun in the big picture, and you'll learn some things. Um, but for me, when I think about why I do it, I, I wanted to share a brief story, if I may. Uh, and there's many, many other stories like this. But I, I'll share one. My very first trip down to Nicaragua, we hadn't started working there. We were thinking about getting started. And we pulled up to this village where now we've built 80-something homes. And you've seen some of the pictures here in our side, you maybe seen elsewhere. Uh, but we, we came up to the home of a family. They had um, plastic. Uh, like bags basically for walls, they had just like a bed sheet for a doorway, um, various pieces of rusted tin for a roof that surely leaked mud dirt floor. And we drove up, we are coming to visit them in a white pickup truck. It's pretty clear when you do that that we're someone <laughs> who has more resources than they do, more opportunities than they do. And that's always kind of a humbling experience. You don't want to that way, but really, that's how you get out there. And this, it is true. And we get there, and we start talking with this family. And um, the father, who's a fisherman, immediately begins to pull off dried fish off of the roof of this uh, little building, and uh, puts them into a bag that he has, and then wants to hand them to me, who showed up here with so much more than they did. He wants to give his food that he's been working hard for, he's done the process of drying, that might well have been their, their planned dinner, they didn't know we were coming even. But just spontaneously, they want to give. And we see that kind of generosity around the world. And our program is set up so that families have the opportunity to become givers, not just a receiver of a house, but a giver themselves, to help on other families' homes, and also to repay the home at no profit and no interest, so that it then gets recycled and more families get to use um, basically, we started this donor money to build um, additional homes. And when you see that generosity, I don't know, that inspires me. And the kids at that home, uh, they were having so much fun. They found a cat. They were putting this t-shirt on a cat. Maybe it's, it's universal to do funny things to cats. I don't know. <laughs> but um, they weren't mistreating them, right? So there was this very nice cat. It was their pet. And they were laughing so hard. They had the most infectious laugh, even though they were living in a place like that. Those are the people you just want to do something with or for. You want to help them have an opportunity in life. And so that's why I stay inspired every day to keep, keep doing it. Either of you have anything you want to share? Uh, yeah, I, one of the, the uh, there, there are a number of reasons. Yeah, I, I never intended to spend my life building houses. And, um, uh, you know, it, it was one of those strange life twists that brought me to this and kept, but once I got started, I couldn't leave it. Um, it was just too fascinating, and too too compelling. <coughs> excuse me, too compelling. And part of it was watching things like uh, Ryan was just talking about being with people who have so little and who are so willing to give. But it's also watching lives be changed, watching volunteers uh, suddenly realize, wait a minute, there is more going on than I thought. It's being able to do something bigger than yourself. I mean, most of us in this room would not think about going out and starting to build a house. But once you get started building a house, you can build a house. It's watching women be involved in the process from uh, they, not just sweeping the floors, but pounding the nails. It's watching people from different cultures come together, young people and old people, 
Baptists and, and Episcopalians and Catholics. You know, one thing I've noticed when it's 100 degrees out and you're pounding nails on a roof, nobody argues about whether you should be sprinkled or dumped. All of those differences go away because together you're doing something that's bigger than any of you could do on your own. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's inspiring to me and every day, every day I realize, you know what, as a result of just showing up today and doing a little bit of work, families' lives have been improved. And what a great, uh, great opportunity that is. Every one of you can have that experience and I, and I hope you do. Uh, Thad was talking about the local work here. They just finished building a house out in the country. They've got different projects going on. We do a lot of restoration and repair work. And there's opportunities to get involved and do something bigger than yourself. Do something with folks who are just genuine, kind-hearted folks. And you know, when you look at all of the nuttiness that's going on in our country right now, and all of the tragedy that's going on in the world, you wonder, what can I do? You feel so helpless. Well, one thing you can do is start helping someone else, reaching out and lifting the life of someone else and see what kind of reward that brings. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, it's a great program, and naturally, you know, we feel pretty proud of it because we're doing it. But uh, I, I, we're delighted to have the opportunity to share some of uh, what we've learned about this work. Okay, and with that, it sounds like we're gonna go to the video. We have a full-length feature film, <coughs> uh, a few-minute video that uh, just give you a little more glimpse. Actually, it should be the other video. Do you have the other one up? Yeah, that one. We 
we don't have a good housing bill, but we know that houses are just part of the package. People need a way to make a living. Their kids need a school. They need health care. So we can be a catalyst to create community. With more than a billion people suffering in substandard conditions, it is up to each of us to search our hearts and answer the question, what can I do? Thousands have already answered that call. Send up your prayers, organize a church work group, write a check, or put on a tool belt and start building. So from our perspective, if there's something that we would want you to walk away with, it would be that this should be, um, we hope not just an opportunity for you to have learned some things and say, oh, that was, that was nice. They do some, some good things around the world. I learned a few things. But we would, we would love to see you get involved with what we're doing. And we have word, word organizations based around involvement, getting people involved. Uh, we're totally run off of uh, volunteer goodwill, off of donations. Uh, we're not a government funded program, so it just relies on people of goodwill who want to do something to make a difference to do it. And I think there might be a few people like that in this room. Uh, so we have, for local work, in the back, when you leave in a little while, there will be a sign up sheet if you want to get involved with local work here in this area that Tad has already shared some about. Um, we also have a number of what we call Global Builders Trips, international trips, to 11 countries. We've talked about some of those countries already. Um, and one of the trips that we usually have sent, we have a tradition of sending, is a University 4000 class every year. Um, we haven't yet been able to schedule that for this next year, but hopefully that will be, be worked out and there will be an opportunity for you to take a trip even right through GSW. Otherwise, we do have what we call open trips. You can sign up and be a part of a, one of our Global Builders trips. We also have um, builds in the United States every year. Information about that is on our, our website. And probably the easiest thing for you to get involved with is right here in, in America. We come out for a day or half a day. I think um, Dad and, and the team here are glad to have you. And uh, there's plenty of work to be done for sure. Um, and then we also have one other opportunity I mentioned Jeff, could you just show the, the last slide from our PowerPoint? Every year, we do a little bike ride. A little bike ride. Uh, so as soon as you see the slide, you'll get it. If we can find that again. So this year, we're going to be doing actually several rides. Uh, we organize these all from here in America, and then we bike all over the United States. We're going to be doing a, a ride down the West Coast, down the East Coast, and across the country. We're also going to be doing a ride on what's called the Natchez Trace Parkway from Nashville, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. We're going to be doing a ride from uh, Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. on a bike trail. There's our map. So, um, uh, not everyone goes the whole way, some people do. Others join for segments. We do one week segments. It's not an easy event, certainly, but uh, with some conditioning, a lot of people can do it. Especially all of you have age on your side, so you're in good shape. We have uh, people of all ages come and do this. We have a lot of, of people in their 20s, um, 18, 19, 20s come and ride with us, but we also have retirees who come to it. And you're not going to let them show you up, will you? So you can do it. Uh, this year we're expecting to have about 150 different people who will participate in this ride for, with us for at least a week long. So if you're interested in that, we also have some cards about that out the back. Next we're going to go to Q&A, questions and answers. So if, if there's any questions in the audience, what, what time is it? We've got, we've got four minutes. 146? Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we did leave a little bit of time for a question or two. Th is that okay, Sarah? Okay. So who has a question for the panel? Okay. How much do these like international trips cost, like travel-wise? Good question. How much do the international trips cost? So it depends somewhat on where you're going and how long the trip is. But say a typical seven-day trip to Nicaragua 
Um, if it's directed with force there, it's a little different you go, if you go through the University 4000 class. I think the university helps cover some of the, that cost. But if it's directly with us, it's typically about eight to $900 plus airfare. And that covers all your expenses on the ground um, and a donation for the materials and some local labor while you're there. And the airfare in Nicaragua, everything varies, of course, with that. But it's been as low as 400 and maybe as high as 800. Any other, another question? Okay. How long does it take to build a house? That's a good question. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> yeah, um, <coughs> that's a real moving target. Uh, we had a project over here in, in Valley, Alabama, just <coughs> outside of West Point, this summer where we built three houses uh, <coughs> in a week. Uh, the first house, the, the house I was working on actually was finished in a week's time from the foundation up. And the other two houses were finished within a couple of weeks. But it can take six months, it can take a year. So it depends, what it depends on are what the local resources are, what kind of volunteer corps there is, and, and of course leadership. But uh, so it can be as little as a week and as long as, uh, as, as a year. The houses in Armenia, I don't know if you noticed, they're built out of stone, quarried stone. Uh, which is, is a fascinating thing. I wanted to make one more comment real quick. Uh, when we showed you that video, that first video we showed you, or the one we just showed you, uh, at the beginning you saw the, the, the uh, hill with all of those wooden uh, shotgun houses on it. That's in a place called, uh, it's in Shreveport, in a neighborhood called Allendale. And when we went to Allendale, the police actually said, you know, we, we would prefer you not go to work in Allendale because we don't think we can adequately protect you there. Well, to Miller, that was more of an invitation than a warning. So we started building in Allendale. The first three houses we built, the families wouldn't move in because they were still so afraid of the neighborhood. So we built another five, and we got the eight turned out to be critical mass, and the families all moved in. Now there are like 50 houses there, and this is where we're talking about community. The uh, major crime rate in Allendale has dropped 80% from the time we started the project till today. So doing this actually has a tremendous effect on a community, or can if it's done right. Are there other questions out there? Surely we didn't tell you everything that we know. Well? Sarah, we have the two minute bike adventure video, if you want us to be able to share that. Uh, it has uh, sound, right? It does. That's fine, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're gonna share the so let's give a hand for our speaker. <coughs> oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, um, enjoy. Watch this short. It's really nice. It tells you more about the, the biking adventure, right? Right. <laughs>